All right, let's step back in time and take a quick journey through the history of ancient Egypt. It's a quick overview to start with. We will start with Egypt's early days, move through its mighty dynasties, and end with the arrival of four in rulers and Cleopatra VII, a legendary reign. Are you ready? Then let me guide you through thousands of years of history. In the earliest days, Egypt wasn't yet a desert. It was a grassland, where Normans roamed, hunting and gathering. Around 4500 BC, they begin to see the first signs of settlements along the Nile. Small farming communities grew wheat and barley, raised cattle and sheep, and crafted beautiful red pottery with black tops. A style that eventually became known as the Batarian culture. As for writing, the Egyptians were early adopters, inventing one of the world's first systems, hieroglyphs. These were symbols that stood for ideas, words and sounds, which they carved into stone or painted a papyrus, a reed-based material from the Nile. Hieroglyphs would evolve into a fascinating script that we will dive into as our journey continues. Now, we meet King Menes, or as he is also known, Narama. He was the ruler who united Upper and Lower Egypt, turning two regions into one powerful kingdom. In ancient art, Narama is often shown as a victorious warrior, wearing both the crowns of Upper and Lower Egypt, one white, one red, symbolizing the unity he achieved. This is the dawn of a new era in Egyptian history. Next, we enter the Old Kingdom, also called the Age of the Pyramids. Pharaoh Joseph kicked things off by building the first pyramids, a stepped stone structure unlike anything seen before. Then, around 2589 BC, we get the Great Pyramid at Giza, built by Pharaoh Khufu. When completed, it was the tallest man-made structure in the world, and still stands as an incredible feat of engineering. The whole nation is thought to have pitched in on this project, either working directly on the pyramid, or at least providing food and supplies for the workers. After the Old Kingdom, Egypt hits a rough patch. The first intermediate period is a time of political chaos, drought and division. With the central authority weakened, Egypt splinters into smaller factions, and of course, grand building projects came to a halt. Now, Egypt eventually reunites under Pharaoh Mentuhotep II ushering in the Middle Kingdom. This is a time of artistic and literary achievements, and we start to see a more complex economy and society emerge. Of course, trade becomes a big deal, helping to grow a middle class. But things take a turn again when the Uxos, a group from Western Asia, move into Northern Egypt, bringing with them a new technology, all strong carriers. The Hyksos take control of northern Egypt, while the Egyptian rulers continue to govern in the south. So, we are now in the second intermediate period, around 1550 BC. Amose, the ruler of Thebes, drives the Hyksos out of Egypt and reunites the country once more. This marks the beginning of what will be known as the New Kingdom. Pharaohs now choose not to be buried in pyramids, but instead in hidden tombs in the valley of the kings. The god amon ere also becomes the chief deity of Egypt, marking a shift in religious practices. The New Kingdom in Egypt's golden age of expansion, Pharaoh Tutmosis I, extends Egypt's borders into Nubia and parts of Western Asia. Egypt becomes now a true empire, and subsequent rulers like Tutmose II and Tutmose III continue this legacy. 
Now we meet Akhenaton, the heretic king, who shakes things up by promoting the worship of Upton, the sun disk, and shutting down the temples of the other gods. After him, young Tutankhamun comes to the throne, restores the old religion, and dies at a young age of 18, and is later buried in a tomb filled with treasures that was astonished the world when discovered in 1922. Finally, Ramses II takes the throne, owning for astonishing 66 years, and leaving behind colossal statues and a temple at Abu Simbo, where he is worshipped as a god. Now, the empire begins to lose its grip during the Third Intermediate Period. Egypt's influence dwindles, and its government becomes fragmented. While there aren't as many monumental projects during this period, it's a fascinating time of shifting power nonetheless. Now we see a parade of foreign rulers coming into Egypt. The Nubians, Assyrians and Persians all take their turn at ruling Egypt. And eventually, in 332 BC, Alexander the Great arrives. He takes control and, marking the start of the Ptolemaic dynasty, Alexander's generals establish a Greco-Egyptian kingdom with Cleopatra VII as its last pharaoh. Cleopatra's reign brings us to the end of ancient Egyptian history as Egypt holds under Roman control. Now, that concludes the short overview of the history of Egypt. If you are still here, well done. Let us carry on to the main part then, shall we? The first dynasty of Egypt marks a time of powerful beginnings, a period when Egypt was united and a new system of governance, belief and life was set into motion, led by kings who held the power of gods on earth. The first dynasty laid down the essential blueprint for Egyptian culture, religion and society. And the first dynasty began around 3100 BC, immediately following the unification by King Narma. With Narma as its founder, this era became the first record dynasty in Egypt. Long royal lineage and spanned approximately 150 years. But Narma was only the beginning. Over the course of the first dynasty, a line of kings emerged each shaping Egypt's identity and legacy. Nama, in the distant regions of the 31st century BC, two distinct worlds coexisted along the Nile Valley. To the south lay Upper Egypt, where people worshipped the powerful Zed, while the north was home to Lower Egypt, whose people revered Horus, the falcon god. These lands, divided by beliefs and culture, were about to come under the rule of a single ambitious king, Nama. Nama was a ruler of Upper Egypt, and through strategy, strength and unshakable ambition, he conquered Lower Egypt, declaring himself the first pharaoh to rule over both lands. This achievement began Egypt's early dynastic periods setting the stage for what would become one of the world's most extensive and enduring civilizations, spanning almost three millennia. Both Upper and Lower Egypt had developed along similar lines over the centuries, yet the rise of trade with other civilizations, like Mesopotamia, had shifted the balance of power to the south. Upper Egypt was gaining prominence with growing urban centers, while Lower Egypt remained a collection of provinces known as nomes. As Upper Egypt grew, so did the demand for resources to sustain these bustling cities. Nama, whose name in Egyptian means he who endures, originally ruled the city of Tinis in Upper Egypt. As an astute leader, he gathered a powerful coalition of tribal leaders 
the Thinite Confederacy. And together, they launched an invasion of the Northern Territories. They emerged victorious and uniting the two lands in a process. The story of Nama's conquest and unification of Egypt is immortalized on the Nama Palette, an artifact found in the ancient city of Nekin, better known by its Greek name Hiera Confolis. These two foot tall slates is the oldest known historical document, and it paints an unforgettable image of Nama's triumph. On one side, Nama stands tall and imposing, shown larger than others to signify his status. He wears the Ajit, the white crown of Upper Egypt, recognizable by its iconic bowling pin-like shape. In one hand, Nama crips the hair of a fallen enemy, while his other hand holds a mace, raised and ready to strike a position known as the Semiting Pulse, a powerful symbol that would be repeated throughout Egyptian art to convey dominance and victory. At the top of the palette, a small rectangular symbol called a Zerek displays the identity of this figure. Within the Zerek, we see two hieroglyphic symbols, a catfish and a chisel representing Nama's name. These are among the earliest known hieroglyphs, etched into history as one of humanity's first records of written language. Above Nama's subdued enemy is Horus, represented as a falcon, clutching a rope tied to an enemy's nose and standing on papyrus flowers, which symbolize Lower Egypt. This image of the falcon asserting control over the north serves as a powerful declaration of Nama's dominance. Below, we see his defeated enemies sprawled at his feet. On the opposite side of the palette, Nama is again depicted in a grand procession. His enemies bound naked and decapitated, with their hats placed between the legs. Nama still shown larger than everyone else, now wears the Deshret, the red crown of Lower Egypt. Identified by its unique coil, symbolizing a cobra, this is the earliest image of a ruler wearing both crowns, representing his reign over a united Egypt. Below, two men hold robes attached to two intervine creatures. Serpo parts, mythical hybrids of, well, serpents and leopards. These beasts are thought to represent the unification of Upper and Lower Egypt, their entwined necks symbolizing the unity Nama achieved. At the palace base, we see Nama as a mighty bull charging through enemy walls and trampling his foes underscoring his power. Another artifact associated with Nama is a decorated mace head discovered in Hiera Konpolis. And this limestone relic commemorates Nama's victories and the unification of Egypt. The mace head shows Nama seated on a throne, bearing the red crown of his defeated enemies, while Captives and treasures are represented to him. A record at the bottom details the spoils of war. 400,000 cattle, over a million goats and 120,000 captives. To solidify his rule, Nama strategically married Maid Hotep, a princess of Lower Egypt, forging a powerful alliance that ensured loyalty from the north. Nate Hotep became queen and the mother of Nama's successor, Hor Aha. Under Nama's reign, the newly united kingdom became known as the Two Lands, a name that would endure for much of Egypt's history. 
But Nama wasn't finished. To strengthen his new kingdom, he led military expeditions to extend Egypt's borders. He pushed into Canaan to the north and Nubia to the south, expanding Egypt's influence and securing resources. Nala also founded Memphis, strategically located at the mouth of the Nile Delta. Memphis quickly rose to prominence, becoming a vibrant hub of commerce and culture, symbols that would become synonymous with ancient Egyptian culture, like the Ankh, which represents life, and the Jet, which symbolizes stability and is linked to Osiris, also gained popularity during his rule. Nama's final resting place is in a necropolis near Abydos, a sacred city in Upper Egypt where many of Egypt's early rulers were buried. Through his conquest, alliances and innovations, Nama became Egypt's first true pharaoh, forever remembered as the unifier of the two lands and the founder of an extraordinary civilization. His reign marked the beginning of the early dynastic period, a new chapter in human history that would inspire and captivate generations to come. Or Aha After Nama's unification of Egypt, his successor, Hor Aha, stepped into a kingdom that was no hole in poised for greatness. As Nama's son, Hor Aha, inherited a unified land and became the first king of Egypt's first dynasty. His name which we know as Horaha, actually translates to Horus the fighter, reflecting his strength and connection to the god Horus. In the early dynastic period, Egyptian rulers were often referred to by their Horus names, titles that tied them to, well, Horus the falcon god, who symbolized kingship and protection. But ancient records also show another name for Hor Aha, Iti, a nepti name for Egypt's early historical lists, including the Turin and Abydos king lists. The identification of Hor Aha with Iti was confirmed thanks to the work of Blindas Petri, who connected these historical records with archaeological evidence. This method also linked Nama with the legendary Menes, making Nama the official first pharaoh and Hor Aha his rightful successor. Around 1350 BC, Hor Aha continued his father's legacy, strengthening Egypt's unity and taking things a step further by establishing Memphis as Egypt's capital. Strategically located near the mouth of the Nile Delta, Memphis was well protected from invasion, difficult to access by both sea and desert. This move turned Memphis into a thriving hub of culture and commerce. Hor Aha's reign was not only about politics, he also introduced important religious practices. He likely established the cult of Sobek the crocodile god in the Fayum region. Known for his strength and fierce nature, Zemek later gained even more prominence in the Middle Kingdom, often being linked with Horus himself. Horaha is also credited with founding the Apis Bull cult in Memphis, a practice that would continue for nearly 2,000 years, even into the Greek and Roman eras. Originally associated with agriculture and fertility, a peace symbolized renewal and vitality, especially connected to the god Ta. After its death, the Apis bull became associated with Osiris, linking it to the Egyptian beliefs and life after death, a theme that ran deeply through Egyptian culture. Despite a relatively stable reign, Hor Aha 
and didn't shy away from military campaigns. He led expeditions against Nubia to the south and Libya to the west, securing Egypt's borders and asserting its power. These efforts laid the groundwork for future conflicts and Egypt's influence in neighboring lands. He also fostered trade relations with Syria-Palestine, opening new economic opportunities that further strengthened Egypt's position in the ancient world. According to Manetho, an ancient historian, Lord Aha's life ended in a rather dramatic way. He was reportedly killed by a hippopotamus. While this may be more legend than fact, it underscores the symbolic importance of the Nile's wildlife in Egyptian culture. We do know that hippo hunts were common, as later records like the Palermo Stone document these events during the reign of Aden, one of Hoaha's successors. Hoaha's tomb, an impressive burial site with three large chambers lies close to Namas in the desert sands of Abydos. These rectangular chambers were excavated from the desert floor and lined with mud bricks, marking a continuity between Namas' reign and his own. Unique to Hor Ahal's tomb was the inclusion of members of his royal household, buried alongside him. Scholars still debate the circumstances surrounding these burials, whether these individuals were killed, committed suicide, or were buried later is uncertain. These burials included servants, women, and even dogs, highlighting the roles and significance of those who lived within the royal court. Alongside the main tomb, 36 Subsidiary burials were arranged in rows nearby, providing even more insight into the structure of Hor Aha's court. These burials included individuals of different ranks and positions, emphasizing the hierarchy of Egyptian society at that time. And, in a striking gesture of power and prestige, Hor Aha's tomb also included a group of young lions a symbol of his royal authority. These majestic animals reinforced his status as pharaoh, connecting him with divine kingship and the strength of the gods. Through his accomplishments in governance, religion and military strength, Horaha established himself as a formidable ruler and his tomb continues to reveal fascinating details about Egypt's earliest dynasties. Each artifact, each burial, each animal, together they create a picture of a time when Egypt was finding its footing, setting down roots that would hold fast for centuries to come. Joe, the Pharaoh Joe, the third ruler of Egypt's first dynasty, ascended to the throne around 3000 BC, continuing the legacy of unity and power built by his predecessors, Nama and Hor Aha, his name meaning Defender of Horus, symbolized his role as a protector of Egypt and its divine heritage. Jur came from Tinis, a city that was not only a political center, but also one of the early religious heartlands of ancient Egypt. While there is little certainty about his exact lineage, it's believed he was a direct descendant of Nama, keeping the royal plotline firmly rooted in Egypt's earliest pharaoh. Jah's reign lasted around 41 years, during which he expanded Egypt's borders and strengthened its cultural foundations. Like his father, Hor Aha, Jah led military campaigns to maintain and extend Egypt's influence in surrounding regions. 
His campaigns took himself to Nubia, east to the Sinai Peninsula, and possibly into the eastern Delta region, reinforcing Egypt's presence and control over valuable resources and trade routes. Back home, he focused on Egypt's economic and religious structure, continuing to establish Mend of Memphis as a central hub of administration and culture, which would become even more prominent in the centuries to come. Joan left his mark in many ways, especially through his impressive burial site, known as Tomb O, at Abydos. This tomb was among the largest and most elaborate of the early dynastic period. The scale of Tomb O, with its 318 courtiers buried alongside him, showcased not only Joan's elevated status, but also the importance of funerary practices in Egypt. Over time, Egyptians even believed that Tum O was the burial site of the god Osiris. Centuries later, Pharaoh Usyarkare of the 13th dynasty added a statue of Osiris to the shrine, reflecting how closely the tomb was tied to the divine. Excavations of Jael's tomb uncovered a wealth of artifacts, from pottery and jewelry to weapons and ceremonial objects, each offering a glimpse into the craftsmanship, material culture, and spiritual beliefs of this time. Among the treasures was some of the oldest surviving royal jewelry ever found. Flinders Petrie pioneering archaeologist discovered four gold and turquoise bracelets, one of the earliest examples of royal jewelry. There is a fascinating story attached to this discovery, shared by Egyptologist Bob Clear. Petri, unlike other archaeologists of his time, paid his workers market value for any items they found. While many archaeologists of the era tried to seize everything for themselves, Petri's fair approach led his workers to trust him, and they brought him even the smallest discoveries. During the excavation of Jal's tomb, a worker discovered a mummy's arm wedged in a wall with ancient royal bracelets still on it. It seemed that during an ancient robbery, a tomb thief had hidden the arm, possibly intending to retrieve it to later for himself. For reasons unknown, the thief never returned. Petri, who was away when the arm was found, returned to the site and saw the jewelry. A gold bracelet with Zedex, and another with tiny gold falcons. Petri weighed the jewelry and paid the worker its equivalent in gold sovereigns. The mummy's arm and its bracelets were eventually sent to the Cairo Museum in 1901. But, upon its arrival, the museum curator removed the bracelets and discarded the ancient arm, likely not realizing its historical value. Petri, reflecting on the incident, later remarked that the museums could sometimes be dangerous places where priceless relics could be lost forever. Beyond his impressive tomb, other artifacts with Jill's name were found at Abydos, including ivory texts that bear his name and titles. These texts likely served as labels, marking objects for various purposes, suggesting that administrative systems were becoming more established during his reign. In addition to the texts, Several ceremonial mace heads with Jer's name and honored iconography were also uncovered. These mace heads depicted scenes that affirmed his royal authority and connection to the gods, underscoring his role as both a king and a religious figure. Jer's contribution to Egypt's religious life were profound. He encouraged the veneration of the god Horus as a symbol of kingship, and also promoted the early worship of Osiris 
the god who would become central to Egypt's belief about the afterlife. By supporting these cults, Jan not only bolstered his own divine status, but also laid the groundwork for religious traditions that would endure for centuries. In his 31-year reign, Jan led Egypt into an era of growth, influence, and spiritual refinement, leaving a legacy that would resonate through the ages. His tomb, artifacts, and even his unfortunate mummy's arm give us fascinating glimpses into the life, beliefs, and ambitions of Egypt's early dynastic kings. Merneith, Queen Merneith, whose name means "beloved of Neith," holds a unique place in Egypt's first dynasty. Some consider her the first female ruler in Egyptian history, and perhaps even the world. But there is still a lot of mystery around her reign. It's uncertain whether Merneith ruled on her own or served alongside her husband, yet. If he was indeed her husband, that is, and then as a regent for her young son, and then during Den's reign, she was named King's mother on a seal impression. Yet she is mentioned on some of the official king lists, creating ambiguity about her status. Ancient historian Manetto didn't mention Menaeth by name, but he recorded eight pharaohs in the first dynasty. If we include Menaif as one of his rulers, then his count is accurate. However, there's also a possibility that Manetho counted Narma as the first king of the first dynasty, rather than part of Dynasty Zero, making Menaif's status less clear. Menaif's name appears on the Palermo stone, without the title of king's mother. But the stone is damaged, leaving only fragments of names, including that of Jules Mutter. Yet, Merneith's legacy hints strongly at royal power. She is referred to as King's Mother on the king list in the tomb of her son Den, indicating her significance in the royal line. And perhaps the most compelling evidence of her status as a ruler. Lies in her tomb at Abydos, known as Tomb Y. This tomb, built on the same scale as other kings' tombs of her time, included forty satellite burials of servants and a solar boat for a journey into the afterlife. A privilege usually reserved for pharaohs. The scale and symbolism of her tomb led Flinders Petrie. To conclude that this was the burial of a legitimate ruler, Renee's tomb was unlike others of her era, with a unique stepped structure at its base, hidden within the traditional rectangular mastaba shape, a structure resembling a low, flat bench. This design might represent an early fusion of northern and southern architectural styles. Which later inspired the stepped pyramid complex. Stone vessels and seal impressions found in her tomb bear her name alongside a stella inscribed with her name in an ancient form, using the crossed arrow symbol of the goddess Neith, a deity associated with protection and war. One of the artifacts found there. A bone labeled as belonging to Berenice's treasury was identified as an offering from the royal treasury, rather than personal property. An unusual and significant gesture for someone without royal authority. After Berenice's time, her son Den took the throne, and his reign marked a period of prosperity and innovation in all Egypt, known as. Orden, he ruled for an impressive 42 years, beginning around 2970 BC. Then, he is considered one of the best documented rulers of the first dynasty, known for stabilizing 
his realm and introducing numerous changes that would shape Egyptian kingship. One of his first moves was to limit the power of Egypt's high court officials, whose authority had grown alarmingly strong. Then became the first king to officially adopt the title King of Upper and Lower Egypt, and was the first ruler to be depicted bearing a double crown, symbolizing unity of the two lands. Nan's reign was ambitious in foreign policy as well. He quickly turned his attention to the Near East, launching an Asiatic campaign in the first year of his rule. On his return, he brought back a harem of female captives, an act that would later be famously replicated by Amenhotep III hundreds of years down the line. And Dan's burial place, known as Tomb T at Abydos, is one of the largest and most refined tombs of the period, whose tomb was the first to feature a staircase leading down to the burial chamber, departing from the practice of filling in tombs directly from the roof. Tomb T also included early architectural elements made of stone, mother, and mud brick and a wooden door was placed midway up the staircase to deter intruders, and then also incorporated a portcullis, a type of barrier just in front of the burial chamber for extra protection against, again, tomb robbers. Inside the tomb, the floor was paved with wet and black granite from Aswan marking the first known large-scale architectural use of such hard stone. This innovation was a testament to Dan's desire for grandeur and his legacy as one of the first Egyptian rulers to embrace the concept of monumental architecture. Together, Merneith and Dan symbolize a transformative period in Egypt's early history. Merneith's tomb and titles suggest that she wielded power in a male-dominated society, while Dan's legacy established royal customs that it would defy Egyptian kingship for generations to come. The innovations in governance, architecture and art from their time highlight the First Dynasty as a formative period for what would become one of history's greatest civilization. Of course, I will talk about Den in another episode a little bit more, but with this we have almost arrived at the end of our first journey. Here are a few more things as takeaway, as well as hints towards other sections of our later journey. First, Nama or Menis, often regarded as the first ruler, Nama unified Upper and Lower Egypt creating the world's first nation-state. Nama's importance is immortalized on the Nama palette, an artifact showing him wearing the white crown of Upper Egypt and the red crown of Lower Egypt, symbolizing his dominion over the two lands. Then, second, Hor Aha, likely Nama's successor. Hor Aha consolidated the new kingdom, establishing Egypt's first capital at Memphis. This strategic location near the Nile Delta allowed for defense, control, and trade. Then we have Jer. During Jer's reign, early expansions in state administration and religious practices continued. Jer's tomb at Abydos is one of the largest of this dynasty and provides glimpses into royal burial customs. And finally, Merneif, one of the rare queens who wielded power. Merneith may have ruled as a regent, her importance is hinted at by her tomb at Abydos, suggesting she held a position equal to that of male rulers. Each king played a role in the early growth of the Egyptian state, from reinforcing its borders to laying down structures of rule and ritual that would echo through the ages. This era also saw significant advancements. The First Dynasty was a period of firsts. First forms of writing, 
first organized government and first monumental tombs. As for writing and record keeping, a new dynasty marks the emergence of hieroglyphic writing, where early forms of symbols were inscribed to keep records. Writing evolved as a tomb for administration, and symbols of power began to be used in conjunction with the pharaoh's name. Then, of course, we have tombs and the afterlife. Mastaba tombs were constructed as early royal burial sites, symbolizing an early focus on the afterlife. These tombs included objects. The deceased might need in the next world, showing that even in these early stages, Egyptians believed in a form of life after death, a theme deeply tied to their religious views and later mythology. Now, life during the First Dynasty was defined by structure and hierarchy rooted in a deep belief in cosmic order. Society was stratified, with the king at the top, followed by priests, officials, soldiers, craftsmen and farmers. So, beginning with laws and order, law was closely tied to the concept of Ma'at, or divine order, which would later become a cornerstone of Egyptian thought. Kings were seen as responsible for maintaining this cosmic balance, ensuring prosperity and justice. Now, roles of social classes. The king was not just a ruler, but a divine figure, viewed as an earthly embodiment of Horus, the falcon god. Priests managed temple duties, rituals, and spiritual needs, while soldiers and craftsmen served the king's will. Farmers formed the majority, cultivating the land with tools and methods that would sustain Egyptian civilization for millennia. And rituals and religion became a formalized part of life during the First Dynasty. The king was regarded as a living deity, a direct bridge between the people and the gods, especially Horus. And this connection to the divine gave him authority over the land and establish his role as the ultimate protector and provider. So, early religious practices, so offerings were made to ensure the gods' favor, and rituals were performed to guarantee that Ma'ad was upheld. Tombs were often furnished with items meant to assist the dead in the afterlife, suggesting that early Egyptians believed the journey didn't end at death. While a full Egyptian mythology developed later, hints of stories like those of Osiris and Horus began in these early beliefs. The king was often associated with Horus, symbolized protection, power, and divine right. The first dynasty also saw the first organized military efforts in Egypt. Kings like Jer are believed to have conducted military campaigns to defend and expand Egypt's borders. Protection of the Nile Valley and its resources became essential as Egypt grew in wealth and prominence. Egypt's earliest known fortifications were likely established during this time, hinting at the need to safeguard the kingdom from external threats. First Dynasty's legacy is immense. It's not only unified a land, but laid down the blueprint for Egyptian civilization. Under its rulers, Egypt's earliest principles of statehood, religion, law, and daily life were established. Principles that would endure for thousands of years. This is the foundation upon which Egypt's grandeur was built. A dynasty that turned ideas into traditions, beliefs into practices, and a kingdom into a civilization. And this was only just the beginning.